All right, guys, we are live for the 2023 August. I don't even know what day it is. It's the 10th, guys. It's the 10th all day. The 10th. Yep. How's it going? Yep. Good, man. Good to see you guys again. Thanks for having me on again. Well, thanks for coming on. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Man. Thanks for coming on, man. You're out. We got, we, we're representing three different time zones tonight, right? Yes, sir. Yep. <laughs> it's just about 6 p.m. Yep. here on the Pacific time. Oh man, that's, that's too early. It's already dark here, and I know it's dark where Derek is. Yeah, nine o'clock, man. Definitely so. Well, yeah. it's going to be a uh, great show tonight. Uh, tonight's show is sponsored uh, by Primary Arms Online. Uh, we've talked about them before. If uh, you haven't been to their website by now, guys, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice because it's uh, definitely an awesome website for firearms, uh -huh. uh, accessories, and alike. You can get all kinds of stuff from there. Derek's probably got like 18 things on his desk that have come directly from there, including uh, the uh, one to six uh, optic that he had there on the table that we so uh did so well with abusing uh through uh i think what six days seven days of a training event out in wyoming and i can't remember if we talked about this last time but derek's actually had the opportunity to after we drug the scope around they got dropped at different points they you know they bumped into rocks they were spray painted and everything else derek you got back out and had an opportunity to uh put some rounds back down range how was it they were still dead on still that on and on top of all that it was traveling right so it traveled out there in the case i mean the case had foam and all in it but it was still you know how they handle luggage it wasn't like baby and it got lost in denver airport for a couple hours because of a belt backup and it was zeroed out there and it came home and it was zeroed here still still nailing you know what was that about a I don't know, a three-inch circle at 100 yards. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, they uh, they handled a lot of abuse. Yeah. So I've got some video coming up with mine uh, with uh, before shooting, during shooting, and certainly after shooting to kind of give you the full rundown uh, on that. Uh, but those optics definitely held up extremely well. Uh, good, clear glass. You know, that was their fourth generation, you know, of that one to six optic. Uh, and uh, by far, uh, they made some pretty solid improvements on it. So I look forward to to shooting it, to testing it more. I'll probably use it uh, this hunting season as well uh, to, you know, dispatch a one or two or three or four hogs or so. Nice. Definitely yeah, so. And, and like I, before the, before this one to six from primary arms, like I, w I was messing around with a one to four LPBO, you know, and get, you know, this one's a six, six by, you know, get two more extra uh, notches to turn to, and it wasn't any heavier, really, than the one before that I had on the on the rifle. So, yeah, and it was it was the, the other one before was a Miata, which is great glass if you know if you know uh, sights. And I would say I couldn't tell any difference in the primary arms glass being not as good as the Miata glass in terms of clarity and eye relief. I mean, the eye relief on this thing was great four inches and boom every time full field of view not looking through the little black uh easy ring thing is that the same rifle that you're repelling off the side of a wall and the rifle's banging up against it no that, that's amazing man yeah oh barrett and i like so we did a zeroing uh exercise what were we at like 50 yards barrett with the yep. rifles and uh barrett and i were so we stacked three bullets on top of each other on each of our targets he, he stacked his, I stacked mine. We had to have a, a we had to have a, a vote to who had the better grouping. Barrett won, <laughs> but I also, <laughs> but I did my zeroing from the seated position. Barrett was prone, so. Sam. <laughs> Very true. The Marine came out at him. He wanted to sit down for a bit. Yep. The uh, now nah, we're I think we're. Uh, Looking forward to having you on again, Mike, you know, for the show, uh, talking about travel tips. Uh, I think it's going to be a good time, you know, to be able to discuss some of the things that you do, you know, some of the things that I do, some of the things that Derek does to help, you know, keep safe, you know, ultimately as we travel around. Uh, and you know, where are some of the places that ultimately that you have traveled to? Uh, just in the past few years. I know you've kind of gotten out of the country a little bit. Uh, and so what are, what are some of those countries or states or whatever? Uh, Africa, Europe, Asia, uh, Southern America, uh, maybe going to Peru, 
within the next few weeks that's coming down the pipeline. Um, but uh, specifically, Japan was earlier this year, had um, Morocco, London, um, a lot, Mexico City. She came back from Mexico City a few weeks ago, um, maybe going back down to Monterrey. Uh, Tecate, uh, Mexicali, Tijuana on a fairly regular basis. But uh, yeah, whether it's by flight or by vehicle, a lot of the concepts remain consistent. And uh, there's what I, what I hope to do with this conversation is uh, typically when I set up travel security for a client with, with my career in security, uh, providing protection services, it's a wide gamut, everything ranging from uh, travel security, executive protection, and so on. And there's there's different needs for different people, different types of clients, whether it's uh, film and television. Uh, that's a wide range of things that need to be taken into consideration. You have different teams going out from locations to the actual producers and, might, and, and higher up executives and such. And so the, the style of awareness or assessments that we apply when planning travel logistics, it adjusts to those lens. And uh, what I hope to do with all those concepts is kind of translate it for the audience of how to do it for the individual, whether it's just you as an individual traveling or whether you're traveling with your family and friends, and or you have to be accountable for more than just your own luggage and your own belongings and your own life, for that matter. So property, body, or life are the things that are typically on the line. And uh, yeah, with this conversation, we'll see where it goes. We'll do it live. Yeah, Derek, I know uh, you've been a lot of places uh, as well, you know, uh, some not so recent, but definitely have a past of traveling around uh, the, you know, world, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've been all over Europe, Mexico. Um, that's it. Europe and Mexico are my big ones. You know, across the Nordic countries. When I was <laughs> when I was seventeen, during the Cold War, Derek got arrested in Moscow. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Are you the Nothing machine? Like I, I, I was I, I was trading, like I was there playing hockey, and we're trading, doing trades with the uh, locals and. Uh, they didn't like the fact that I, I gave up some bubble gums and a jeans jacket for an East German flag, a military winter coat, and then a little can of Russian snuff. I had little <laughs> messages hidden inside of the compartment or something. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I got to keep out of that whole ordeal was the flag and the snuff. At least you got the snuff. I was going to say, at least you got your snuff. I know that made you happy. <laughs> but it wasn't the kind of like the good kind of snuff that like back then I don't think I was I was a snuff guy yet but like back then it, that was their snuff was the like the you snorted it snuff not the <laughs> put it in your lips snuff right right, right. yeah uh, the real snuff yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah I had more. my first experience of snuff was with hape or rape it's the indigenous stuff that they take a bird's bone and blow into your nostril that's fun Ooh. yeah that, was uh, fun. <laughs> that uh, sounds erotic right. <laughs> i don't know about that one Desargo. yeah well you know it's uh, something that the hunters used to do for it, it uh produces acetylcholine dopamine and adrenaline in the brain so you get hyper focus you know so they use it either for night hunting or for deeper exploration and uh, we'll leave it at that <laughs> so almost like, a, like a, an all-natural uh pre-workout that's 100 percent what it is man and uh, there's people that have been using it forever. And the, the main question is whether, because it's tobacco, but it's, it's, it's a different form than what the tobacco industry corrupts. And uh, so the question is if it still does the same kind of damage. But there's old indigenous tribes that have been using it all their life. Not to say like, oh, my grandpa has been smoking for all his life kind of deal. But right. it's an interesting medicine, to say the least. Definitely. So, yeah, y'all have got uh, plenty of experience both in the country, out of the country. Uh, you know, most of my travel has been all over around in the country for the past few years, but have definitely spent a little bit of time in Mexico uh, a few times over the past couple of years as well. You know, uh, I, every time I get near Mexico, I've got a problem. <laughs> I've got to head south for tacos. Yeah, Desargo yeah. <laughs> and I were in Tijuana, you know, a little yeah. bit last summer. You know, Gotta get the in, tacos. That's right. I was in Juarez a little bit this summer, a little bit last summer as well, uh, and and so yeah, you know I've got uh, you know, a little bit of experience as well down in Guatemala, 
uh, traveling around the cities and whatnot. Uh, but ultimately, I, I think that we should have a great show tonight, you know, with uh, lots of, uh, you know, different backgrounds and experiences that are ultimately going to be brought into it. Uh, but it's all about travel, you know, travel safety, whether you're traveling outside of the country or you're traveling inside of the country, maybe just across town, there's definitely some things that are good to, to put in place and have in hand. And so, yeah, guys, where do you want to start tonight? I'd like to start with mindset because then we're done with the show, right? Just pay attention all the time and we're done. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so, <laughs> the reason why I want to start with that, because my mind has recently changed about mindset. I've actually gone away from mindset because when words have meaning, when we talk about mindset, then your mind is set. It's stuck. It's static. And that doesn't reflect the dynamics of life. And so what I like to teach nowadays is more mind state. You have to have an awareness of your mind state because situational awareness isn't about mindset where you're always paying attention all the time. It's about learning how to leverage your cognitive flexibility, meaning knowing how to shift your attention and manage your attention from one item to the next. So we want to really consider our mind state, even in the planning stages. Uh, if we're going there on vacation, you know, there's going to be times when you're going to want to take pictures of your family and your mind state will be focused on capturing that photograph, getting your family together, getting them positioned. You're not really aware of pit pockets or potential threats, but there's a way to shift your attention and manage your attention accordingly. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about, if that's consistent with what you guys are aware of. But ultimately, I wanted to open that up with situational awareness and what your guys' thoughts are on the whole mindset versus mind state idea. I'm down. <laughs> I knew Derek was going to have some thoughts on that. No, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I mean, that's, you know, exactly it, right? Oh, it's, you absolutely, you know, there are times that, you know, we throw around buzzwords of <laughs> proper mindset and awareness. And Derek always kind of jokes around with like condition fuchsia, right? As long as you stay in condition fuchsia, you don't have to worry about anything. Condition fuchsia, I'm pretty sure is, toes in the sand and eating tacos or something like that. But, yes. You know, that sounds amazing. Somewhere around paradise. Right. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, know, but you know, absolutely. You know, to, to that, I mean, you definitely, you know, how, where your mind is in the state of your mind is going to be a huge part of travel safety. And, and I think you brought that up, right? It's, you know, I travel with kids a lot, right? I've got a couple of them. You've got kids, you know, uh, Derek hangs around my kids sometimes and Rob's kids. So yeah, that kind of counts as well. But yeah, there's, in fact, I mean, I, I was on the road this summer for uh, about 5,000 miles, if I remember correctly. And so, you know, through that time, uh, you know, some with kids, some without kids, some spending with Derek and all them. Uh, but, you know, ultimately through that time, uh, there was a tremendous amount of time that I was worried about photographs. You know, and I'm worried about framing the family. I'm worried about, you know, capturing the moment, you know, so that we can go back and look at it, you know, later on in life. And, and through that, you know, while, my attention is on the camera and on the frame and on the kids and trying to get them to smile and everything else, you know, where, what is my state of mind, you know, during that? And, you know, and to me, you know, it's, especially when you put me around, you know, places that aren't my home with my kids, mm -hmm. typically that state of mind changes a tremendous amount. Right. Because you're in a learning environment where there's a lot of things that you may be unfamiliar with. It's not quite routine. And that kind of brings us to the point of registering and, and recognition. Right. And so um, to have situational awareness, the biggest problem with it, when people blame you for not paying attention, the reality is that you didn't recognize a stimulus that was supposed to be your spidey sense. Right. There's an, a behavior that was outside of baseline that we didn't register. It didn't even process. Things just happened. I didn't even see it. I was blindsided by something. Right. So let's take, for example, dining at a restaurant in, uh, say, uh, a foreign country where pickpockets or thefts are commonplace. And I put my phone on the table, which we typically do. Right. I mean, if you're polite, you put it in your pocket <laughs> out of sight. But uh, a lot of us tend to keep it on the table, which is rude to the people we're with. But uh, it's a reality that we live with. And that paints you as a target where someone 
may come up with a map, seemingly harmless, put it down and ask you for directions or maybe a menu or something if you're at the restaurant and engage friendly conversation. And the pattern of behavior seems consistent with the dialogue where they're putting the menu between your eyes and your phone and you're engaging that conversation and casually as part of their natural body language they'll lower the the menu and pick up the phone with the paper on top concealing it and be along their way you may not even realize that it got lifted off the table the registration should be that first of all you have something valuable on the table second is when someone is for whatever reason impeding your line of sight to your valuable on the table so with mind state, that would be the first step to shifting your attention from the social debt, which is something that manipulators use. Uh, let me explain what social debt is real quick. Uh, when I was single in my 20s, my buddies and I had this routine at the bar where we would go in and pay the bartender maybe a $100 tip or something and just say, listen, all I want you to do is when I flag you down, give me a priority and I'm going to buy a drink. That's all I'm asking you to do, right? And if we see some hot chick at the bar, buy her the drink and say nothing, right? The bartender goes over, gives her the drink she, that she orders and she expects to pay for it. Bartender says, don't worry about it. That guy paid for it, right? Without saying anything other than just raising a glass and then paying attention to the friend that you're with at the bar. In any case, most people don't want to be rude or impolite, so they'll at least be in the debt to come over and say thank you at the very least. So now the onus is on that person to engage in social conversation. It's less creepy. They're just coming over to say thank you. It's a nice gesture and it's not threatening because they could walk away, right? So that's something that thieves tend to do. Thieves can create a kind of social debt. And so if they walk up to you, they give you a compliment, they walk over to your table, um, ask for directions, it seems polite to give them directions, you know, especially if they're needy, if they're pleading, whatever the case may be. That could be a registration. It's like, okay, I'm going to be respectful enough to give this person what they need, but now my spidey senses are tingling. I'm going to be ready for anything. I'm going to look at my uh, valuables, maybe even take the valuables off the table, and then now continue and paying off your social debt to that person, right? And this is how we shift our mind state. The first step to being able to shift your mind state from what you're doing is registering the red flags, and that's part of the planning process with the travel security. When we start examining certain countries, examining certain destinations, we can assess what kind of common behavioral patterns are with the crime statistics. You know, if there's a high pickpocketing thing, whether you're going to Paris or you're going to London, when we talk about violence and talk about carrying, we know that guns are outlawed. So a lot of the violent crimes will be carried out with blunt instruments or edge instruments. So layers to planning, right? We've got to plan something that may happen in the future and create some things to prevent that. But we also need to plan what we'll do when it actually happens. And that's part of the training environment. And so am I prepared to remediate violence of that nature? And that's something that you do if you're part of personal defense network. The assumption is that you're probably doing some hand-to-hand, -hand, that you're probably doing some etched weapon, that you're probably doing some firearms training, right? So these are all things that are commonly get overlooked with our layers of planning for travel security. Uh, but circling back to the registration and shifting our mind state, to have that cognitive flexibility, we have to first, as part of our planning and uh, assessment, is recognizing the behavioral patterns of the thieves, of the people who might engage in violence. Um, there's the terrorist aspect. There's the unrest aspect. There's the um, criminal aspect. Doing all those assessments and assessing the behavioral patterns associated with each if you choose to continue to travel to that destination if they have some kind of travel advisory, right? So we used to have um, political unrest, a lot of protests that turned into riots, right? And you know, we have the First Amendment. We have a right to vocalize our opinion. So it's not to say, well, that's going to turn into a right. It's going to get violent. Don't go. Well, you might want to voice your opinion, but you also want to recognize when the threat actors arrive on scene. And uh, typically, they're masking their face, whether it's all black or whether it's khakis and a polo and uh, uh, baklava. I know there's different profiles, but there's different uniforms that have typically occurred during these protests. And you see who the people are that instigate it and escalate it to the level of violence and mayhem. So recognizing and registering what those profiles look like, you can go out, you can protest, voice your opinion, exercise your rights, 
And when those red flags materialize, you shift your mind state to, okay, now we know it's about to get bad. I've made my opinion heard to the best that I can, but probably it's a better decision to boogie out at this point, right? And so um, don't want to go too far off the handle because I'm going off different rabbit holes, but hopefully that's all relevant. And uh, yeah, let me know if you guys, if I'm hitting the right spots that uh, there might be questions in the comments or any questions that you might have. Well, I got, I got the, I found the chat roll, Barrett. So I got that rolling over here. I don't have anything in there yet, um, but I, I am tracking that. But you bring up a good point with the, you know, the social debt thing. Um, like when I used to, first started teaching uh, concealed carry, and I still do it from time to time here. We'll talk about out and about, and like, what are we notorious for here in the U.S. Still is holding doors for people, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's a habit of, you know, you, you want to be, you know show good manners, you know, be helpful, whatever. And I, I always tell my students, you know, hey, if you're going to hold the door for somebody, you really need to be mindful and pay really good attention to what you're doing. Are you are you putting yourself in a bad position by holding this door for somebody? Have you mm -hmm. used your strong hand to hold the door? Should something go wrong and you need to get to one of your tools, have you now all of a sudden you have to let go of something to go do something else? You know, so we, Absolutely. Like the balancing act of, you know, is this the time to do it? Is this not the time? And then when you're on the road and like in other countries, in some countries, like holding the door for somebody is like really, really, really an odd thing where people will actually put on the brakes and look at you and like not walk through the door because you're holding it for them. So, you know, learning the, the culture or learning yes. what's acceptable in the different places you travel to. Yes, absolutely. You hit it right on the head. And uh, we'll start with uh, that with, um, you know, when it's property, body or life, we're talking about, um, life in this regards where if something bad happens someone leveraged social debt and then you had to make that plan of am i using my weak hand strong hand to protect my life and access is it the most efficient way to do things so in certain countries um there's a bit of a, a scamming pattern uh for example certain places will walk up to you and offer you guidance to where you need to go, whether in a marketplace or something rather. And it may seem harmless, right? Where do you want to go see? And I'll take you to that vendor that you're looking for. If you're looking for a specific exotic item, whether it's like a specific tea set or a specific exotic rug, say, oh, I know the guy, I'm going to go here. And you'll think, oh, these people are super friendly, right? And at the end, you'll be obligated to tip or they're going to ask you to tip or for one reason or another. And for whatever reason you don't, then everybody else just materializes out of nowhere. Somehow, some way, everybody comes out and you're surrounded by people and there's a show of force that you should probably tip before it escalates to violence. So that's something to take in consideration is typically try to be self-sufficient. Try not to owe anybody anything, right? And if, because even if you tip, if you're wearing anything or if you take out your cash, because a lot of times what happens with travelers is they don't memorize the exchange rate. They exchange a bunch of money. They put it all in their wallet. When they go to tip, they take out maybe a low denominator, but then they see all the rest of it. And then yep. gives them an opportunity to ask you for more. And you don't know how much you're giving out. Then later you go back. It's like, oh, crap, I gave that guy 100 bucks, US dollars. <laughs> right? I didn't know. It's just a lot of currency I was handing out, right? Um, right. And so with your cash, try to keep it separate. The cash that you can expose, I typically keep... Um, my about 300 equivalent us dollars in in local currency and then i keep maybe less than 50 dollars worth of usd in a separate pocket or a separate wallet and then i keep maybe 20 dollars loose in my pocket so that way when i take have to take cash out of my pocket they're only seeing it i know it's maxed out at the equivalent of 20 us dollars so i'm only exposing a limited amount of of money if that makes any sense. So that's one of those things that you can plan for is, okay, I want to prevent the opportunist. And then also I want to be respectful, but I also want to be self-sufficient so I'm not indebted to anybody, right? Another uh, scam that people have, uh, I think this is also in Europe, where they might have a music performer and they'll place their cup in a high traffic area where tourists are not paying attention to where they're stepping. And what happens is you incidentally kick it over and so you feel bad, they pick it up, they're trying to pick up whatever change they have, and they manipulate you into owing them 
a tip because you just knocked over their stuff and stopped their performance. And if you hang out long enough, you'll see them restage it and look for more tourists and put it right where they're going to kick it. And so these are all things that you have to take into account. You can still be respectful, but it's just register that idea that the way that you get played is by leveraging social debt. And so if you can be respectful, but also be cognizant of being overly polite and giving in to having to owe people something, right? Um, with train stations, a common thing is people will crowd the doors and with your baseline, here in the US, we tend to give people personal space, One of the, and even with the traffic as well, right? Unless you live in Los Angeles on the 405 during rush hour, then of course you're bumper to bumper. But the, one of the reasons why I love driving in Mexico because vehicles have no personal space. So it's like you're up and tight and it's hyper aggressive and it's just normal, you know? But if that happens here in the States, some people look at it as road rage. Our perception's a bit different, right? Our, our social norms are a bit different. So when we get on transit in the United States, we tend to have a bit of personal space, but when we get in other countries, it might be tight. There might be a lot of people making physical contact and a uh, common strategy is to, to block the doors. So you have to make physical contact coming in. And it's usually a team, typically females, because they're less threatening. But it can be a wide range. It might be elderly people, but they'll crowd you and you get a lot of physical contact. And what that physical contact does is it camouflages their access to your pockets or to your purse or to your backpack. So some uh, quick travel tips that you can do um, is either travel with zipped up pockets or register that red flag that the second you're in a, a place where there's a lot of physical contacts, just start putting your hands over your valuables so you can feel what's happening around that area, right? If uh, you're concerned about RFID, you could get RFID wallets. The near field communications thing is, is a real deal where there's devices that you could just put near someone's purse or, or pockets. And if their wallet is there, then they can start charging your credit cards right off the bat and so um, getting something that uh, blocks that kind of communication isn't a bad idea uh, these are all different strategies you can use but you got to register the threat behavior right yeah, so I, that's yep i was just saying yep. even talking you know in pickpockets i don't think a lot of people realize how many professional pickpocketers that are out there you know not just other countries but you know here in bigger cities right you know, just um, at Mardi Gras of this year, you know, they, uh, you had all the professional, you had all the local pitpocketers, but you had people that were coming in from other countries, other countries. that were hanging out on Bourbon Street and were, you know, yeah. taking phones and wallets and everything else very quickly before anybody had an opportunity to even register it. And, you know, I, I know of, uh, you know, one individual that, you know, working in law enforcement witnessed the pickpocket immediately, you know, was able to put his hands on the pickpocketer and the item was already gone. Like he witnessed yeah. it, you yeah. know, and yeah. it was already gone because it was that quickly was completely handed off to someone else, you know, but these were people that weren't even citizens of this country, you know, and yet they were here, you know, during Mardi Gras uh, to be able to capitalize on it. And, you know, when they uh, looked further into it. I mean, th this guy had been to the Super Bowl. He had been, you know, to Mardi Gras. And I think New Year's Eve, he just come from like New York or something like that. So, I mean, literally just kind of bouncing around. And it's, you know, it's it's obviously it's going to be all over Europe, but it's, you know, but it's all over here. It's all over here in the U.S. And so that's definitely something, like you said, you know, zipped up pockets, uh, you know, something that puts that extra layer in place that prevents someone from easily being able to distract you through physical touch or through anything yes. else yes. and be able yes. to quickly grab your items. Yeah, so. you hit it right on the head, man. Um, and there's one thing, the distraction, right? I've been nerding out on Jake Weskerchen's uh, from Walk the Talk of America. He has a, a video on emotional functioning and um, outstanding. I, I, I highly recommend everybody go to YouTube and Google emotional functioning from uh, Zephyr Wellness. But um, the reason why I bring it up is because there is a distraction strategy that polarizes you. It, it gets you so emotional that you stop thinking about things and then it, it, it triggers an emotion and the threat actor is actually a hero. So here's how it works. You get mustard packets, right? You walk up to a guy or a gal and you see something of value and you squirt the mustard packet on their leg or near where that valuable is, or I'm sorry, the opposite side of where that valuable is, uh, but in and around the area. 
you take out tissue and you start trying to communicate in your broken English that a bird pooped on the person, right? And so you already have the tissues in hand. You look, you see like this yellow nasty substance that gets you immediately grossed out and disgusted. You're trying to think about how to wipe it and the person already has the solution for you. And all you're thinking about is getting it off. Your emotions are full of contempt and disgust for this nasty thing on you. And so that gives them, you just give them permission to pat you down, get physical contact. And now you're grateful. It's like you're hyper-focused. You're fixated on that thing as they lift your valuables out of your purse or your back pocket kind of thing. And so emotions are also an indicator. Uh, emotions signal a change in your environment. And uh, it only lasts three to nine seconds. The only reason why we feel that it sustains longer than that is because we're either dwelling on something in the past or anticipating something in the future. So with proper emotional functioning, you know, if you do get pooped down, you're like, Ugh, okay, I recognize <laughs> what I need to do but now I got to let it go so I can expand my awareness. That's one of the amazing things about perception is your aperture actually opens up when there's less stress involved and hyper narrows when there's a high level stress involved. That's what a lot of people call tunnel vision, survival positive in the worst case scenario. But I'll try not to go down that rabbit hole right now. We can certainly chase that another time. So, so, so you're saying it's actually a survival positive that I don't like people touching me. 100% man. 100%. To some degree. Like, why are you so weirded out by people touching me? Now I'm like, you know what, babe? It's a good thing because you know what? It keeps me from getting pickpocketed or anything like that. But I do have to clarify. It's not that you don't like people touching you. It's that you don't like people outside of your tribe touching you. Exactly. That's what I mean. Like, obviously, yeah. you know, put your hand on my back. I'm not going to be like, oh, don't touch me. You know, but I'm right. talking about right. people I don't know. I don't like. I don't, but, you know, that's the thing when you travel, right? Like, we, we like in the U.S., personal space is the thing. And like if you're standing in line at McDonald's or some store and somebody's standing like way too close to you and you turn around and say, hey, could you give me some space? Right. The only person that's going to be offended is the person that's standing too close. Everybody else around you is probably like, oh, my God, I can't believe somebody would do that. Yeah. But like, yeah. Like, right. saying, like I was uh, I was in Turkey. This was like in the 90s and I, on a on a train. And it was like literally like cattle car. Like we were smushed in this thing. And I've seen similar like uh, videos of like trains in India. That's like, Mardi like, Gras, man. And, and like <laughs> I remember my the the woman I was dating at the time like losing her mind because somebody was grabbing her butt, and you couldn't tell who it was because everybody was just like you know sandwiched in there. You couldn't yep. even tell who was doing it. Yeah, absolutely, and. Um, that, that's the social norms and everything. And, and people who consider that unusual, right, probably come from a genetic line of safety. And so this is something super interesting. It's kind of like uh, when you have kids and you try to teach them to sleep in their own room outside of uh, the parents' bed. It's a very unnatural thing because in the wild, like, the parents have to stay close to their kid because they could get you know, by a dingo or something, right? And so it's kind of a unnatural thing to be able to have the safety and security to put the baby in a separate room entirely than from the parents and not have to worry about it. Uh, it's kind of the same thing with personal space is, you know, that's a survival positive thing, you know, and, and people who come from being sheltered or safe, which is not a bad thing. I'm going to say that in a condescending way. Um, they're not conditioned. They don't have the reflexes. They don't have that registration that, this should make you pay attention. So immediately when someone's close to you, your defense mechanisms, which is a survival positive, immediately kick into high gear, you know, and I'm very much the same way. And, um, and so it's, if you're going to a country, so in my job, we have to really blend in, right? And so I may not have the luxury of moving away or requesting that personal space. So I have to overcome that and just start understanding what the baseline is and just start monitoring other indicators of a threat, right? And so property, body, or life. And we've been talking a lot about property and we talked a little bit about uh, life, but uh, yeah, I mean, same thing with uh, sexual assault or rape, you know? Um, there's some indicators there that uh, we have to watch out for. Uh, specifically when we're traveling, there's a lot of tourists want to have that overseas fling, you know? And so they might be a little bit more liberal with um, how much they're drinking and 
and what they're drinking and where they're going, not really taking their safety into account. And in that regard, it's always good to have a designated defender to make sure that the person that you leave in the bar with is the person that you actually selected and that that person is not being selected by somebody else. It's just the most basic way to mitigate that risk. If the, if the person didn't tell the designated defender that that's the person I want to hook up with, then don't leave them leave with anybody else. You know, um, it's a really easy way to think about it. There's more complex strategies, but that's like the simplest way to go about that business. Um, obviously, the whole thing with drinks and protecting your drinks and all that good stuff. But what I hope to do is provide some unique information. Um, things like hotel stays. All right. Uh, this is something that uh, we've talked about in the past, I believe, with um, staying in a hotel, you know, rather than being on the first floor because it's the most accessible being on the second or third because it's not so far from evacuation that should a fire or some other disaster occur, it's not such a long trek to be able to escape the hotel, second or third floor. And um, one of the biggest threats to your property inside the hotel is going to be housekeeping or unauthorized access. Because if you're in an Airbnb or if you're in a hotel, you're not the only one that has access to that room. So it's not a secured room regardless of the locks that are installed by the owner. Right. So what so, do you do on that? What do you do to, you know, to put other layers in to help secure it? So when I'm leaving the hotel. I would uh, typically put some kind of deterrent. So basic fundamental uh, security principle is deter, detect, delay. Right. And so right. I use a, a little mobile UV camera that has some LED lights that reflect and flash. And it basically shows that it's recording. So Almost every hotel that I've stayed in, the second you open the door, there's some kind of table or something that you could put that on that that could be the first thing that you see when you walk in the room. The second someone opens the door, they'll see a camera pointing right at them, right? Um, something with hotels is that they have a uh, captive portal, and that can boot it off the uh, internet and Wi-Fi. Um, one way to get around that is to get a Wi-Fi extender. That does a couple of things. Yeah. I'll have to log into any other captive portals. Uh, you just log in straight into the Wi-Fi extender and it tends to keep it uh, logged in so you don't have to repeat the captive portal where you put in your last name and room number kind of deal. Um, yeah, but I'll, just, uh, that, I travel just, you know, I bring my AT&T hotspot and connect the uh, camera to that AT&T hotspot and take it out of, you know, the wireless uh, for the hotel. Obviously, you know, uh, this works in the country. <laughs> Uh, yes. And you can run into the other issues outside of the country and outside of cell phone service and that kind of stuff. But yeah, if, when I have the option, I take it away from the hotel Wi-Fi yes. and put yes. it on my own hotspot. Absolutely. And that I mean, I from a cybersecurity standpoint, you know, like we're talking about physical and stuff like that. But, you know, like I just had my uh, debit card. Somebody just got a hold of my debit card number somehow and spent $119 at Wingstop. Yep. Like, I, good time. At one time. <laughs> I don't know, but maybe that wasn't me. Party that I was not, <laughs> um, you know, but you, by just using the hotel Wi Fi, you're opening yourself up to a lot of like um, personal, like personal information going over that line. Like, they can get credit card numbers, they can get login 100%. information, you know, if you, and that's you, want, you know, um. That, that leads me precisely to the next step in the tools I use in the hotel, uh, because typically corporations should be able to build their own VPN. So there's, let me first define something. There's anonymity and privacy and anonymity, anonymity <laughs> got to work on my English here, um, conceals who you are because identity theft is a thing, right? Um, the privacy conceals what you do. And so, those are two things that we want some level of confidentiality with, right? And so encrypting your data as it transits is a thing. And yes, if the individual uses something like Proton VPN or some commercial VPN, they are sending their information to someone else's computer. So now comes the idea of risk and benefit. You know, are you more at risk by a threat actor that's trying to steal your money and identity? or a corporation that their business is based on providing a VPN and them selling your data or giving it to a nation state. Uh, so, I mean, if you're like a terrorist, you probably don't want that, 
or something, right? Or if you're some kind of drug dealer, you probably don't want that. But uh, if you're an everyday person, I mean, I'm exaggerating. There's other situations. Um, if you want to be completely off grid, it makes sense to me. But uh, ultimately, you have to have the know-how, right? You have to have the know-how and capability to build your own VPNs, to build your own servers, and build your own encryption, so that way you own everything and you can conceal both your identity and what you do online. But for the everyday person, Proton VPN, you know, right. I'll never trust Wi-Fi. Use Proton VPN. I, I think the risk is low of you having a negative impact for you using a commercial an everyday person using a commercial VPN. Yeah, I mean, I've got, you know, all my devices are set up to automatically, you know, use it. In fact, I even run a VPN, you know, most of the time at home as well, uh, unless, you know, I intentionally, you know, turn it off at that point. Yeah. And like right now, the only thing in my house is not going through the VPN is this this broadcast right now. And it's purely because when you got a VPN, as you guys know, and viewers probably don't, you do have overhead that is associated with that encryption. So it will slow your your yep. connection down. Now, if you have a gigabit connection like I have here, it yep. probably would be good enough for the show. But we've had technical difficulties and stuff like that. I don't even want to risk it. Right. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. I've got um, mine off for the show as well. All right. We've got a couple of questions that have come in. You know, uh, one, you know, apparently I'm wearing a psycho color. <laughs> so uh, John says that Barrett's got a wearing a psycho color, but he also said that Derek's head's glittering. And so uh, thanks, thanks John, <laughs> thanks John for the comments. Oh, but, I'm glistening when the sun comes out. That's right. You know, but we did get a question uh, coming in as well about you know manner of dress when traveling, and mm -hmm. you know I think this is a, a really good question. It's yeah. one thing like uh, you know each time that uh, last couple of times I've gone to Mexico, you know I've done my best to attempt to blend in, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you want to kind of fit the norms. Now it's I you see me, right? I don't I don't look Mexican. You know, I, I don't you actually look, do. <laughs> yeah, actually do Hispanic at all. <laughs> and so, you know, even with me trying to blend in, there was a lot of, hey, gringo, gringo, come here. You know, <laughs> I, I still stuck out like I was carrying a big red flag over my head, waving it, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and going through Juarez. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. So, I mean, I think that, you know, that, you know, what you're wearing, obviously, you know, that was already brought up by Mike was when it comes to pickpocketers and that kind of stuff, you want to make sure you're, you've got zippered pockets or, you know, tighter pockets, hard to reach pockets, something you can easily cover, you know, something that, that somebody's not easily being able to get their hands into. Right. But I think it's also important to try to, you know, to play the part as much as possible if it's, you know, if it's something that's important. And I think yeah. that when you're traveling to areas that there's a higher risk of, you know, whether it's assaults, uh, sexual assaults, physical assaults, or, you know, something just property crime, you know, the more that you blend in, the the less that, you know, you are sticking out and could easily become victim of. And there's the challenge. Uh, I mean, obviously, we don't want to broadcast wealth. We don't want to broadcast value. Right. So we try to blend in, right? But there are certain circumstances, say, if you need to go to a business dinner and you need to show success. So you need sure. to have a nice watch on. You need to have a business suit on. So and for whatever reason, you need to take some kind of transit because you don't have a rental car. Um, you're not controlling all that. And so a solution to that is to have an overcoat, assuming that it's cool enough for that. Right. But you basically got a Clark Kent Superman that, you know, depending on your risk profile. You know, if you're going in, you need to go to a high crime area to meet with or you have to transit through it for whatever reason. Um, like in, in New York, you have, it's easier to take the train, but the train stops by some not so great places, right? Um, so these are some, I have, a, I have a buddy that lives in New York and I always give him crap when he comes out to LA. Um, I don't want to walk in public with him because he draws Asian hate. And so that's kind of a thing, right? It's like, well, you know, you might go through some some areas where there's a lot of Asian hate, bro. I don't know if I want to walk next to you, man. <laughs> yeah. um, but there's things that you can do to cover yourself up a little bit more, you know, reduce your profile. And it really comes down to the question of how do I dress comes down to, well, what do you want to do? And then you want to facilitate. That's that safety third idea. Once we identify what you want to do, what are the risks involved and how we mitigate those risks? And so for when it comes to Mexico, I highly recommend against wearing anything shooty, like 511 or any military apparel, anything of that nature. There's been quite a few 
former or current military that has run some errands and crossed the border for the cartel, you know, um, and you just, it's easily get mistaken by both law enforcement, federalists, marinas, or just everyday people. If you're coming out, even a sling bag might seem harmless, but that's a commonly used item down there. And you don't want to be, you, the, the case of mistaken identity is significant. There was an old case of uh, a security company who was riding in suburbans and they got shot up, killed everybody except one person. We're able to interrogate that guy, found out that, yeah, there was security for a corporation and they told they released them to send the message to the rest of the maquiladoras or manufacturers that their security must have identifiers on them so they don't shoot for us ask questions later um and that's just one of those things case of mistaken identity is a real threat so how both how you dress and what vehicles you use or what motor transit you use what kind of items and tools you use that may identify you is something to take into consideration whether you want to broadcast wealth or if you want to broadcast that you're an everyday person. Um, there is a situation um, in another country and they have this kind of like onesie that they throw over. Uh, it's called a jalaba. It's kind of like a robe kind of thing. And um, if you had to go out there by yourself and you're in a high crime area and you had to do some things and you had to hurt some people and you need to evade other people because you stand out. Like if it was you, Barrett, and you had to drop some people, having one of those jalabas in your backpack might help you because that easily conceals your westernized clothes with the exception of your shoes. And uh, easy solution, take off your shoes because it's not uncommon to walk barefoot. Wow, right? I'll fit in. <laughs> there you go, right? Just the clothes in the stand over here. Who said I was um, wearing shoes? <laughs> <laughs> Chokes on me. You don't own shoes. <laughs> but Just kick those puppies off and keep going. Yeah, but but <laughs> going back to how you appear, your body language broadcasts a lot. I'm Filipino. When I go to the Philippines, they know I'm American. It doesn't matter how much Tagalog I right. speak because my body language and the way I move and the way I sit, it broadcasts who I am. And so a good idea if you go into a foreign country is monitoring their gait or how people walk, how people sit, their demeanor, right? Um you could see people when they communicate in their native language, they might, you know, how people talk with their hands, right? right. Um, whether the chin rises or whether they lean in when they accentuate things, whether they pock their chest up. These are all subtle cues that tell you what culture you come from. And so that's part of your dress. It's not just about your clothes. It's also about how you behave. Um, all of that goes to what you're broadcasting because you could try to conceal your clothes, but you could still be spotted a mile away simply by the way you walk. You know, simply by the what your gestures with the your hand gestures or your head gestures, it might give it away. Uh, so, I mean, that's getting really deep in the weeds of things. But I wanted to make sure that I presented some ideas that maybe haven't been presented before that uh, I think is worth consideration. Definitely. What are some of the other modes of protection that you? may favor in different places that uh, would uh, not typically allow you to carry a traditional defensive tool. Yeah. I mean, get that a lot, man. Um, and it really comes down to, I can't stress enough that you, you as a human need to learn how to fight. Right? right. Like once you understand the human body and how the brain works and you subject yourself to violence um, for a hobby, then that builds a certain era of confidence because you know, even medicine, right? And when you learn medicine, you learn what not to do because it could kill somebody. It could injure somebody with malpractice. Like look up all the malpractice. That's how you fight, right? Um, it's, it's, there's certain things that you can do. Um, you're, you're not powerless without a gun, right? And so that first and foremost, I wanted to get that out of the way. It's just like, get some kind of uh, defensive training. So if you do a few, like six months of Muay Thai, maybe a year or two of blue belt in jiu-jitsu, get some grappling, get some striking, get a fundamental understanding of edge weapon. Aaron Gennetti has by far the best edge weapon program that I've seen as far as countering edged weapons and such. Uh, I, I, I like it. I mean, I might be a bit biased, but as unbiased as I can be with looking at what he's actually doing, I dig them, man. I recommend that program. Uh, blunt instruments, um, so Filipino martial arts with the sticks and stuff, gives you some fundamentals. I mean, all these martial arts, the problem with it is that the more complex the skill set is because it's accounting for the counter 
for the basic skill set. And the reality is most of the bad guys have just the basic, like and we're talking right. about this strike or this conjecture or this overhand strike with a stab or something, right? And so if you take the train, there's value in martial arts training, but then you tie it together with the context of defensive training, right? That's that's how you tie it together. Once you habituate that, then you register violence in your brain, you register what you're capable of. All the people, uh, I just did a video with, um, the ghost reload or the mer the uh, simulating the reload, right? And uh, naturally, the internet's going to internet and comments going to comments. And you know, people are like, well, you wouldn't need a reload. Statistics show that you know, seven to ten rounds, the fight is over. It's like, okay, I guess we shouldn't practice reloads then. <laughs> right? But uh, um, a lot of people can't wrap their brain around. Well, if you're out of bullets, you're screwed. You better run, or you better do. No, you're not. You can stay in the fight, man. Because the reason why you're shooting back is because you couldn't run away. That's the whole premise. Right. You don't apply lethal force unless there's no other option. So think about that. There's no other option. You can't run away. You can't evade at that point. You better figure out a way to bring the fight, right? So I had to get this out of the way because the gun is the most efficient tool for personal defense. It's not your only tool for personal defense. You are the tool for personal right. defense. Sometimes it's the worst tool for personal defense. I, I mean, we see plenty of videos where people are bringing firearms into play. Yeah, and look at that. You just get still hear me. Man. Oh. So I've lost my video. Can y'all still hear me? You yeah, lose your video. You. you just put on your stealth mode. <laughs> I just watched the camera turn off. <laughs> so watch this. We'll bring in. <laughs> I'll bring in a little bit different angle. Y'all can't see it, but I've got a little bit different angle up while I attempt to uh, pull the other camera back into play. But yeah, I mean the gun is you know, only going to be a tiny part of it. Like I was saying, I mean, there's there's times that, that people try to pull a gun out into a fight that that's the worst thing that they should be going for right now when they really should be trying to control the other individual or control the other individual's weapon, right? Uh, yeah. And, you know, we carry firearms for personal defense, but there's plenty of places I go that I can't take the gun. You know, whether that's just from, you know, a month to month traveled on an airplane or something like that, uh, where the gun's not allowed, the knife's not allowed, the pepper spray's not allowed, the taser's not allowed, where none of this is allowed, that doesn't mean I'm unarmed, right? And I, I think that the, the number one weapon that you get to take with you is your brain. It's, it's making yeah. good decisions. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, you know, and outside of that, the, the one thing that you you have available to you is, you know, is going to be your physical skills uh, that ultimately that you've developed, you know, mm -hmm. right? And, yep. and and getting enough that you can protect yourself. Uh, there's one of the stories that I'll tell in my classes and whatnot, uh, where, you know, a couple of years ago, you had um, a individual who uh, pulled out a can of wasp spray you know because everybody oh. thinks that stuff works but this was yeah. the attacker so the attacker pulls out a can of wasp spray inside the new orleans international airport uh and in the tsa security lines you got people walking through security this guy walks up pulls out a can kind of hoses down you know the uh individuals in the environment uh and you know ultimately pulls out a machete and starts hacking at people Right. Yeah. So there you are. You're in the TSA line. Yeah. You got the guy with the machete who's literally yeah. attacking people yeah. at contact distance, hacking away. You don't have a gun. Yeah. TSA screeners certainly don't have guns. You know, you don't have your knife. You don't have this. You don't have that. So what are you stuck with? Well, you're, you're stuck with the ability to either A, you know, use your brain and potentially get away from the attacker or B, you got to be able to physically handle yourself right, and, and move in you know, to stop the aggressive behavior. Uh, and, and you hit it on the head with the machete scenario because that goes back to our assessment and your planning, right? Um, where our plausibility changes based on where you're traveling to. There's plenty of places where machete fights are still a thing, Latin America, um, certain parts of the Caribbean, um, certain parts of Africa, right? Like the machete thing is still a thing. And so if you train those martial arts, you're familiar with contact weapon or even defensive tactics. That's a common thing in defensive tactics, knowing how to stay just outside the reach and then being able to close the distance rapidly. That puts you in a certain level of comfort where I can remediate this. I can manage this because the question is always going to be like, this is my go-to tool outside of um myself and whatever I trust in my teachers and what they teach me uh, as far as uh, martial arts and, and fighting goes. 
but uh, this tool has never been confiscated. It's it's a surefire stiletto. If I shine it, it's a thousand lumen. It could disrupt vision. Um, it's not going to incapacitate by that. It's not going to incapacitate by just blunt, but it's it's a uh, force multiplier in the sense where I could still hold a clenched fist and I could still strike with it. And if I need to run up on somebody, if I'm familiar with that machete, I can disrupt his vision, get him disrupted enough that I could close that distance and start working with dismantling their grip on whatever tool they have, whether it's a gun. I mean, it's very difficult with a gun. But again, if you have no other option, if the other option is, I guess I'll just die, then you better start figuring it out, right? Make the other person pay. Well, know, I guess so. I mean, you've had about 20% of the active shooter incidents that have been stopped by unarmed civilians. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, again, if if they've got a gun and you don't have anything else, you know, and you've got the ability to to be able to do something, you got to yeah. you know, use violence, take action. And again, going back to the destination. So in the States, the the what drives that is they're looking for easy targets, right? They're not expecting a fight. They're expecting a one way range. Right. And so when the fight comes to them, easy day down in Mexico it presents a problem it, because they, the separation between robbing and killing isn't that far down there. Right. And so, I mean, they can give walk people, up. you know, kind of an idea. Right. And it's just cho choosing somewhere that's touristy like Tijuana. You know, we look at New Orleans and, you know, I think we're at the top as a murder capital right now. We're a tiny city, you know, we're less, way less than a million people, less than 500,000 people, I think most years since uh, Hurricane Katrina, you know, but we see about 250 murders per year and yeah. somehow per capita that puts us up there, right? And then you look at something like Tijuana that on a violent year, you know, they're like at 10,000 know, in <laughs> one city. Yeah, so, yeah. Like you said, that separation between yeah. robbery and murder is, you know, it's not the same as what you're going to find in New Orleans where, you know, most people who are dealing with armed robbery on a daily basis are going to be at their house at night. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize that this is a generational uh, transmission of, of murder where, like I got out in 2017 or so. I still go down there and occasionally I'll pick up work, but I used to be full time. And 2017 was its record breaking year. And that's still being broken to this day, you know, as far as the, the murder rate. And uh, literally back then, they didn't have enough uh, room in their morgues. They're stacking bodies outside, you know, and they just didn't have the resources at that time uh, to account for all that. So people were literally getting away with murder. And uh, they, the, in the old days, it was known that I say old days because I haven't checked recently, but at least before they would recruit children. And there was a process of teaching them how to kill animals and, and groom them to become sicarios, right. right? And so that just becomes the norm. And then like we could just spend a, a few days down there and we'll come across a body kind of thing. And so when someone intends to rob you, they're already afraid for their own life. And so it's not beyond them to escalate from robbing you to killing you kind of thing. Right. Um, and so if you bring the fight, like get the training, man, you know, the, the fantastic thing that happens with those active shooters is the swarming effect. When you inspire others to act and engage when it's a one-on-one -on -one robbery. Um, yeah. You're on your own for the most part. And so you, I highly recommend everybody consider those scenarios if you're traveling to those kind of countries and uh, be ready. A lot of people talk about training for the worst case scenarios, but their training methods reflect them as a hero. You know, they're choreographed, they're doing it and, and they're doing it again, they're rehearsing it again. They're not uh, planning for the unexpected. And this is kind of a relatively modern training method in sports. What they found is like, I'm going off the handle because I get kind of passionate about this, right? But uh, hopefully we'll have time for this, but it'll be worthwhile. Um, with like uh, football plays, right? They draft up the play, the receiver or the tight end goes out, they run a route, they catch the ball. So they plan it, they rehearse it, they catch it, they're awesome in practice, right? Um, what they're finding now is that we need to train the brain to not um, assess, plan, execute, but assess, plan, execute, forget, and do again. So what, what I mean by that is now you're in the game, Ball's height, you run your route, but now you have a defender fucking up your route. Am I allowed to curse on this? I'm sorry. I'm already I'm passionate. <laughs> so I gotta remember to like dial down my passion when I talk about this stuff. But um 
So now you have someone disrupting your route and disrupting what you want to do. So now you have to forget what the original plan is, adapt around it, and try to figure out how to stay on the same path in time to catch the ball. So you're kind of forgetting and you're improvising at that point. And that's what's missing a lot in firearms training is that a lot of firearms training is rehearsed and staged, two shots here, two shots of that target. You're not preparing for the unexpected. Your first shot isn't from an unexpected position. And then your multiple target engagement, it doesn't come from an unexpected orientation to the target, whether you're moving, have to stop moving. There's all these other elements that are unexpected, unplanned that you're going to have to plan, do, forget, and then assess, plan, do. You know, that's the value of being able to move laterally. Now assess your positions to target, extend out, punch out from this unrehearsed orientation to the target. That's what transfers over. You know, um, I'm going to write an article soon. It's on record. So now I have to follow up about contextual interference and how it diminishes your performance in practice, but it actually helps you win more games. So what, so, what date should we expect it? I know, right? <laughs> Hold me to it, man. <laughs> um, give me a date because if I don't get a date, then I'll get it done. When do you guys want it by? <laughs> Before the end of the tour. Okay, I could get that done. Cool. Yeah, that's you know, we're, right now cool. we're in August. Uh, you got about a month, I think. A month? About one month right. to have it landed on personaldefensenetwork.com. Yeah. Or at least I'll get it your desk. <laughs> All right, cool. I'll hit you guys offline about that, but I'll get it uh, done. But uh, yeah, so get training. Um, that's what, I mean, this tool. Oh, the other thing I want to answer that question. So this can help. And whenever I go to a place, uh, when I was in Oklahoma City, I forgot. Well, I didn't want to check in any luggage. So I couldn't bring a knife on the plane. But it's really easy to find a $20 knife that meets the, meets the minimum standards of grip, of accessibility, of open ability, and uh, making sure that when you stabby stab that it doesn't slide down and cut your hand kind of thing. Um, you could go to anywhere in the world and they're going to have a knife. They're going to have an edged weapon because it's a kitchen tool, right? What's your um, even the airport in the secure environment. <laughs> Literally, there's restaurants that have right. knives there, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, so yeah, like you said, knives everywhere. Uh, yeah. you know, so knives are a thing. You know, it's... Um, it's amazing, you know, if you happen to pick up a screwdriver or something like that while you're yes. traveling around yes. overseas because a screwdriver yes. is a tool, right? And so yeah. I, I, I need tools a lot and have a tendency to, you know, to travel uh, with tools, you know, legally, you know, for that right. matter. And it's something to typically, you know, and I wouldn't be better at. Yeah. So it, it's called martial arts because it's subjective. It's it's not an objective thing, right? It's an, it's right. an art. It's a craft. And the master artsman, the master craftsman, whether it's a painter or a musician, it's not because they memorize the best songs and can play that really well. Um, it's because they can improvise. They've mastered, they, they reached a certain level of expertise in their craft that they can improvise. And so I highly recommend everybody to get really good at violence so you can improvise that these answers become self-evident because different opportunities will present itself wherever you go, right? You just understand how injuries work, how trauma works, and then how to apply that trauma, how to affect that trauma. You could improvise whatever tools you want, you know, at that point. Then everything else is just about context. What's yeah, happening in the circumstance? How can you figure out and navigate that circumstance? But a lot of that comes down to your training method. Right. You know, if you rehearse, you choreograph, you're not prepared for the unexpected. And we got another don't... question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, I mean, we got another question to... about yep. uh, knives. Just as, since we were talking about it, uh, knives in the UK, you know, and obviously there's, you know, there's plenty of countries you're not allowed to carry a knife, you know, and and so we would never, you know, promote violating the law, but to the degree that knives are available. So if you're, you know, uh, in Japan and you're, you know, shopping for high end, nice, fancy sushi knives, you're going to be able to find them, you know, in the retail shops around the streets. Uh, and, and I don't think it's going to be any different than really anywhere you go. You know, when I was in Guatemala, you could buy a machete on every street corner for that matter, you know, so it's there, there's stuff that exists inside of that environment that if you needed an edged weapon, it's there. But back to what Mike was just saying, you know, it's, it's understanding, you know, it's understanding trauma, it's understanding violence, understanding the body, because then it's not about the knife or, you know, about the gun. Uh, it's, you know, you have the ability to improvise, uh, you know, or adapt. Well, I mean, is it a screwdriver? 
or is it an ice pick? I mean, that, I can't tell. Like, zoom in, you know, because yeah. is it's it pointy? Is it, yeah, it's a pointy, right? And so, right. like, if you were trying to, I mean, I don't. TSA is not going to allow you to fly with an ice pick, you know. Right. But if you're someone who uses tools from day to day, and you needed tools in your backpack for whatever reason, right? You know, you are allowed to fly with certain tools, right? Or but I'm, not as I'm a weapon. So don't desk. think you can go fly with a tool for a be a weapon because I don't think you can do that. Right, but yeah. if you need uh, tools, you need nice tools. This is not a tactical pen. Right, yeah, I, I carry the same thing. You know, pen. nice. I used to carry a tactical pen, and the problem with the tactical pen is it was tactical, and right? Was and then all of a sudden, I got you know, you got whoever screeners asking about it, and I'm like, that's silly because all I really wanted in life was just a metal pen. So now I've got a metal pen. It's the same thing. Yeah. It just doesn't look, you know, crazy. No, uh, yeah. and you know, it's a pen, so no one's gonna bat an eye at it. Right. It, it could be a tool or it could be a weapon, right? It's right. all a matter of mindset and how you hold yes. it. Yes. Yeah, definitely so. It, definitely so. It's And there, um, there are tools that, um, like, 3D printed Sharpie markers. It's well, a Sharpie. It looks yeah. like a Sharpie. It's in the shape of a Sharpie, but it's a bit Sharpie. And so... <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I just, I picked up, a, a, a like, a big, you know, almost, uh, I guess it was a polished rock, glass, marble-looking thing about two inches the other day. At some point, you can expect a video from me on even improvising that, you know, as a defensive tool. And again, you know, it's just something I picked up in a street shop, you know, while traveling the summer. You bring up an outstanding point because we tend to go from projectile weapon to edged weapon, but we overlook the most obvious, the blunt weapons right. are everywhere, everywhere. They are. You know, you know, it's and it, look, you can get as creative as you want. You know, it's it, uh, I used to travel with a padlock because I needed the ability to lock my bag up in places, right? So it's, you know, it's uh, it's you've got everything around you, you know, to be able to improvise uh, if you needed a weapon, right? And it's uh, I, when I teach active shooter response courses to teachers and whatnot, it's like look around in your classroom. You know, it's like I'm looking at 39 and a half different weapons and I'm going to count that half if that's all I have available. Right. You know, but for the other 39, it's like they can make legitimate weapons if you are willing to be violent with them because you have no other choice in life. Yeah. And to simplify for those who don't have any training, target of, of opportunity, my go to is square in the middle of the nose. Just do some blunt force trauma there. that will disrupt their vision with the tears that come pouring out will disrupt their breathing with the blood that comes pouring out and the other uh is going to be the back of the head you got the visual processing centers and the motor cortex um you do significant trauma there if they don't go lights out because it's it, it can be fairly difficult to knock somebody out right but when you understand those targets of opportunity you know it, those are some desirable striking points that aren't that hard to access now if anybody's taking any uh kind of training that they know that the vagus nerve is on both sides of the neck, blunt force trauma there, or even to the trachea, you know, um, how to access that with a fully resistant person trying not to let you do that. But if they're in that stage, they're not attacking you. So you're winning the fight. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, just some fundamental things like just punch people in the nose, just punch them in the nose. Right. And that's I mean, for if you haven't been punched in the nose, it doesn't matter who you are. It's not, you know, it's not fun and it's not something that you see directly through. Right. It's like yeah. that's one of those areas that whoever you are, you know, it's uh, it's surprising. And it know, is say more and more people get used to it. They get struck in the nose a whole bunch, but it's still a very surprising blow to have happen that doesn't even take a lot of strength to, you know, to disrupt what's going on. Yep, Surprising, disorienting, disrupting. It's a valuable yep. target. All right, we got uh, one of the comments. Somebody said they hate uh, that they don't travel much anymore, you know, because they don't feel safe without their firearm, you know, that it's hard to leave outside of their, you know, state uh, where they're allowed to travel. And, and I mean, I already know what my comments would be to that, but since, Mike, you're the guest, man. That's, how it, that's your you, biggest what would your, Right. What would, you, what would you coach that person? How would you coach that individual? That's the biggest threat is feeling unsafe without your gun. That means that you're incapable to some degree without your gun, right? Um, I don't mean that in a berating or condescending sense, but uh, we need to work on weaponizing that person so they know that the tool is our backup, just like 911 is our backup, right? That it's a tool, it, it's a leverage that you're applying, it's an option. It shouldn't be your only 
mode of safety. Now, granted, the reason why I appreciate guns is because I get older, I get less athletic, I may be, not be able to move as well, right? So there may be some people that have movement challenges, but there are still some things that you may do. So there are certain circumstances, you know, that uh, like their only mode of defense really is the firearm because they're so for, but this is like a logical fallacy. If they're so physically incapable, how can they reliably use a gun uh, kind of deal? And so that's, the, I mean, I, what I'm saying is there are some situations where I understand that they can't go out and do martial arts, right? They might have some physical um, restrictions there, but if there's something else that they can do, there's other ways to apply trauma start studying those other methods of applying trauma, whatever is within their capabilities, start filling up those gaps in their vulnerability. Cause if the, like if, if that guy was a bad guy and he wanted to use his gun to do some bad guy things and someone took away that gun, where does that leave that bad guy? <laughs> right? I think we're kind of to the active shooter situation where they're, they're, they're powerless without the gun. And so that's something I want the gun community to really reflect on and, and digest and process is without my gun, who am I as a defender, as a protector? You know, can I still do something? Am I within your means? And and there are solutions. You know, if there is a certain situation where I can't do jujitsu, I can't do Muay Thai, I can't do this because of this, this, and this, man, just message me. I'll help you find a solution. You know what I mean? And but, even uh, if it's not the physical skills, right? I mean, obviously, yeah. if you can get better at the physical skills, you should, because it's going to give you the confidence to be able to, you know, to be separated from that firearm in plenty of situations. Yeah, but if you, if there's some reason that that you are prevented physically from being able to get out there and learn the physical skills, then there's plenty of software skills. You know, uh, you can still get out and travel. And part of you know traveling is just going to be to do the research on the front end. You know, yep. understand the area, change your habits, change your behavior, uh, and give yourself the freedom or choose where you go, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously there's, there's certain places that, you know, that are, you're at higher risk of violent crime than others. You know, not all vacation zones or, you know, not all travel hotspots are going to be at extreme risk of, you know, of, high, of, of violence. Yeah, and, and to your point with the cost benefit thing, the risk benefit thing, and the risk may outweigh the, the benefit of going if you can't bring your firearm. However, you can transfer that risk, right? You could hire protection or you could bring people to designated defenders with you. You know, if you have a group of people that you trust that are capable, travel with them. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's not uncommon. There are certain people who don't have the bandwidth to focus on the security. They can't afford to shift their attention, their mind state to something else because they're business oriented or they're creative oriented where they need every bit of bandwidth focusing on what tasks they want to perform. Then they need to outsource their security. You know, that's a thing. It's a thing. You know, there's people who are elder that need to outsource their security, whether you're paying for a professional or inviting friends that you know who are capable. That is a way to transfer that risk to somebody else and just absorb that protection. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions coming in? No, I was just checking the different places, a couple of different comments and whatnot, but uh, I think that was all <laughs> of the questions. I need some sort of program that ties all this together. I can see you know, all, all of the uh, locations uh, that this goes out to at one time. Uh, and not just, you know, jumping around from tab to tab. Chat roll is clear. I've been, I've been checking that. Yeah, chat roll seemed pretty quiet tonight. Part yeah. of me's like, wonder if it's working because everything else seems to be pretty chatty. Well, I think yeah, yes, because I keep seeing uh, numbers of viewers go up and then individuals, like when they, somebody yeah. actually has an account and logs in, I see their name pop up and I've seen it, like the numbers changing throughout the night. So. Definitely. So I, before we break, I'll talk about this real quick. You know, I don't know. Uh, I was going to talk about it earlier. And then I realized it wasn't sitting on my desk. Then my uh, wife brought it up to me. Uh, <laughs> then we got off the subject of hotel security or Airbnb security and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, but this little device, and I don't have any connections to the device at all, but this little device is something that I use uh, in Airbnbs and really use it all summer traveling to different places. In fact, we were at one you know, place out in California this summer 
that had one of those uh, you know doors uh, split top and bottom, and the lock was kind of busted, you know, and I can't remember if it was the top or the bottom. The lock was, maybe it was the top. Lock was busted on the top side of it. There was a deadbolt on the bottom. Uh, and so, you know, this little $15 device saved me real quick for being able to actually lock the door, you know, because otherwise <laughs> I couldn't have locked the door. Uh, yeah. And so if y'all haven't seen these, they can work in hotels and whatnot. Uh, a lot of, you know, standard doors goes in the latch. You know, you kind of rotate it over to where everything lines up properly, tighten it down. Uh, and it really, you know, in about 20 seconds can secure that door that, you know, you don't trust the lock or you don't trust who's got a key or not. You know, uh, whether it's your bedroom or, you know, the hotel room that you're staying in, it gives you one more layer of security. With that said, it's harder for somebody to get in, which also means it's harder for somebody to get out. And so that is what you have to balance in life is that the last thing I want is to be finagling with some little tiny gadget at three o'clock in the morning in a smoke filled house that I'm not familiar with because it's on fire and I'm trying to escape or my kids are trying to escape. Right. So you've got to weigh it against that kind of stuff as well. But, yeah, there's, um, you know, lots of different options like that. Derek, you probably have a wedge it, you know, with yep. you. You have one yep. like laying on the desk. Um, actually, my backpack is sitting in the other room. Otherwise, I would. My backpack's normally sitting. Right yes, next to me. and that's uh, I normally have all that kind of sitting next to me too. But uh, don't at the moment. Uh, I've got a green screen behind me, and everything's kind of sitting in the back side of my office and whatnot. But yeah, there's lots of different options, you know, to be able to put those different layers in place. And I think that yeah, that's going to be part of it, right? Using the cameras when you travel, you know, doing the research on the front end, knowing the places you should be going, knowing the places you should not be going. I use the uh, Spot Crime app, you know, a good bit mm -hmm. as well when I travel. Uh, it gives you a, you know, free wise anyway, seven day history of the crime uh, in a specific area. And so I'm able to pull that up and look at it, even when I'm choosing Airbnbs or choosing hotels or something. And I can pull it up and look at it, but like, oh, never mind. We are not staying anywhere <laughs> around that area. Right. And, and it's yeah. before I even booked the place on the front end. And you know, that's a lot of what security is about is, you know, is understanding, you know, where you're trying to travel to. Well, cool. Well, uh, obviously, thanks a bunch for being on, uh, Mike. Uh, Derek, Mike, y'all have any other comments or thoughts before we tear out? I just wanted to throw out there a question was asked for me. I did a post previously about some of my tools. Um, I use also use a firewall or purple. It's uh, some engineers from Cisco kind of broke off and did their own thing. And it's uh, uh, a way to spoof the data and everything. But it, it's basically a portable firewall that has its own VPN. I bring that with me to the hotels and I connect it uh, to my hotel network. So that way it's secured, it has some firewall rules and such. So you have your anonymity and privacy and, and all that good stuff. Um, so those are essentially the tools that I travel with to hotels, uh, aside from the locking mechanisms and the strategies and tactics there. But yeah, we could go on and on about a bunch of different tools, but I want to make sure I threw that out there because that was asked previously on another yeah, well, that yep. post is actually what spawned this this show. When you posted up, you were in the hotel, and I saw your firewall and uh, stuff like that. And I said to Bear, I sent Bear to, a screenshot of your post. I said, you know what? That's what our our topic needs to be: traveling oh. security. Get Mike on. So that's that was the the primer. Awesome, man. I'm glad I could contribute. No, it definitely was, and I, I think you know if I if I don't break the show, I'm pretty positive we yeah. could talk for a couple of more hours on it. You know, yeah. because uh, we all do pay attention to that kind of stuff when we, you know, travel. And as mentioned previously, you know, Mike professionally uh, has done this as well uh, to help not just keep his family uh, safe, uh, but others and safe that uh, he was in charge of and whatnot. But Mike, man, thanks for uh, being on the show. Thank you, guys. Absolutely. Always enjoy it. Uh, we will be back on the, is it the first win uh, first Thursday? in uh september let me make sure that that's not disrupted by uh the yep so it will be uh, first thursday in september uh we'll be back on uh we'll be talking about different colors uh that are available in optics whether you're talking about an optic for a handgun optic for a long gun uh, we've got uh, somebody coming on that knows a tremendous amount about the science behind all of that kind of stuff and how our eyes uh, relate uh, to the different colors that are currently available 
and what the future looks like uh, with this as well. So I'm really looking forward to that show. I uh, hope uh, to see y'all back for the first Thursday in September show on that topic as well. And thanks again to Primary Arms Online for sponsoring the show tonight. Other than that, guys, y'all have a wonderful night. Thank you, guys. Yeah.